Hello, this is Bryant Myers, and welcome to another episode of Debunking Flat Earth. In this episode, we are going to school Witsit on relativity and point out his very fundamental misunderstandings of the subject. And this video is in response to, well, several emails that I've gone back and forth with him because he just doesn't seem to get it. And number two, he's done three Schooling Globers videos, and MC Tune and myself have been really targeted more than anyone in these videos. So this video is in response just to put this all to rest. And, you know, these videos really are a freaking joke, as we'll see here, because he's just going by quotes, and he doesn't understand the math, as we'll see very clearly. And um, he doesn't understand dimensional analysis. He doesn't understand what reference frames are. And I'm going to show you proof. You're going to see that what I'm talking about. He doesn't understand that we cannot measure constant velocity locally. He doesn't understand the Michelson-Morley experiment. I mean, I think he understands a lot of it, but he doesn't understand the fundamental aspect that it's not about measuring the orbit of the Earth around the sun. He just doesn't seem to get that. And he doesn't understand length contraction. He still stubbornly thinks that length, lengths contract within the frame that we're in, even though we can't detect it. He thinks there's an actual physical shrinkage of our contraction in our frame, but we can't detect it. So we're going to definitely go through that. But before we do, I want to kind of um, bring up something that I made a mistake, you know, in full disclosure and confession here about three, four weeks ago, and he just won't let it go. He keeps bringing it up over and over again. And I said, what's it? I've already told you. I, I admitted I made a mistake of not understanding your position and misapplying the Lorentz contract formula. And he, here it is right here. I even sent him this. And funny enough, he is using this like the thousandth the width of a human hair. And these are calculations I've given him. So he doesn't understand the math. But I did misapply it, and um, it, it came from... So let me just play a, a short little clip from this Flattoberfest so you can kind of see where my mistake came from. So if the Earth is spinning around the sun and there's an Eve there, if we shoot light with the motion of the Earth, and then we shoot light against the motion of the Earth, they should get back to the receiver at different times. One's going with the motion, one's going against it. The, the light going against the motion of the Earth would take longer to get to the receiving ends of the perpendicular rays on the table, right? So this is the expected result here. As you can see, they, there's a separation. One gets there later. In reality, when they shot the, the light, they got it much closer to identical than uh, is predicted by heliocentrism. Okay, now it wasn't perfect, uh, but it was not anywhere close to the prediction. This was hands down the biggest uh, shift in physics in modern history, not even close. Most of you guys were never taught about this. You may have heard about it, you know, since you've been in flattery third research, but how could the most famous experiment that changed all physics been left out of curriculum? It's for obvious reasons that has drastic philosophical implications. So this is the actual result, of course. It is in no way separated the way that it should be. So this is where the fuzzy hair crackpot comes back in. He says, via special relativity, that that the ruler, as you can see, the ruler physically shrank. Okay, so there was a difference. You just couldn't tell because the, the ruler physically shrank that measured the difference of the light. This is top tier physics uh, to this day. People believe this is real. He's thinking that these fringe panders are disappearing because the arms of the Michelson Mori experiment are contracting. So I, I didn't really fully, you know, the, the Michelson-Morley experiment, something I haven't looked at in a long time, so I, I forgot the details of it. So my, but I did remember the length contraction formula. I'm like, boy, that would be a minuscule amount because the Earth is going around 30 kilometers a second around the sun, and the speed of light is three times eight to the, three times 10 to the eight meters per second. So, you know, it's like 10,000 times faster than the Earth's velocity around the sun. So I did the numbers, and I found that that the arm itself would only have to contract by 55 nanometers. So I'm like, what, what's, what's the thinking here? This is, what's, how is that going to do anything? Again, I didn't rec recognize that, that in, and again, this isn't what happened, but if, if it was to physically contract, it would contract by about this much to compensate for the differentials and speeds. It, again, if they were measured, but they weren't. So I basically had the calculations right. I just didn't apply the reasoning, and he won't let it go. And I'm not even sure he really understands, you know, what I was telling him, but he does know that I was wrong and I admitted I was wrong. So I'm like, okay, I've been studying relativity now for the past three weeks. Pretty, pretty, I'm not going to say full time, but uh, definitely been studying it. And I've learned a lot. And unlike Witsit, I'm okay to admit I made a mistake 
and just move on from it. Where he won't, where he's making fundamental mistakes all along, and he won't even look at the possibility that he's made, making mistakes. So, um, and here we go. Just I won't really get into this here, but just these emails. He's like wanting me to admit in public that I was wrong about what I just said, and he just won't let it go. He just keep, and this is just three emails. He he keeps doing this in his live chats. He keeps bringing it up during um, like debates. He'll be in the chat and he'll bring it up. It's like admit you were wrong, Brian. Admit you were wrong. It's like what's it? I've already admitted that I'm wrong, and you just can't seem to get past that. And all the while, you've been wrong all along and you won't even look at your mistakes. So just kind of going through some of those fundamental errors, I want to play these two little clips. They're two little shorts I put on YouTube. And I just want people to hear this because it's clear that he doesn't understand the math and he's actually all too happy to admit it, as you can hear here. But I don't do it. I think math sucks. I think it's like, it's, just, it's such a way to get lost in the weeds and stuff, right? So he's thinking math sucks and that it's a way to get lost in the weeds because... All he does is cherry pick quotes, and sometimes they're not cherry picked, but they're cherry picked in the sense that he's misunderstanding them for his incorrect model. And meaning he might sometimes have the quotes correct and even and maybe and maybe even at times interpret them correctly, but he's using them to support a model that's flawed. Just to show you, this is kind of humorous here because he's trying to school us Globers, and he doesn't even know the Lorentz contraction formula. So I just want to play this little clip from, it's a YouTube short from the debate between FTFE and, and what's it? And again, FTFE made a mistake too, just like I did. And he was happy to admit it. But all the while, what's it makes a fundamental mistake. I mean, at least FTFT knew the length contraction formula. Uh, let, let's hear this little exchange here because it's kind of humorous and it's also enlightening as to how uh, what's it does not understand relativity. Do you know the the equation for length contraction, what's it? Instead of you detracting, will you respond to the actual? I'm not. I, I am. This it. Really stop. 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 Yeah, you got gotchas. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to give me. I'm not going to play this any question. It, hey, as soon as you address my actual points that are, I am addressing your point. I am addressing your point. If you if you let me get there, the equation is L equals L O times the square root of one minus v squared, which is the v is the velocity of the object, yeah, no, no, the no. over c squared, which is the speed of light. I didn't wrong. think that of anything. I That's studied wrong. that earlier and paid attention to it. You're wrong. You said it wrong. Um, no, I didn't. Uh oh. Which bit did I square? Over c squared. V squared um, over c squared. Yeah. No, I don't think so. Yeah, v squared over c squared. Pretty sure it's v squared times c squared. Pretty sure it's v squared times c squared. No, it's... <laughs> I had some fun putting that together. But but the funny part is, is when you look at the formula he used, if you Google length contraction formula, I was like, What's, where the heck are you getting v squared times c squared? And he's like, well, that was a different form of the equation I was using. And actually, no, it's not, what's it? There is no form of the Lorentz factor that is v squared times c squared. So he lied about that. He was he was basically, again, I don't know this for sure, but if you Google length contraction formula, you get the V squared C squared. But the funny thing is, is when you click on this link that has it correctly, it's because of formatting of the Google preview that they left the divide the dividing sign out. Because I think it was a symbol when you had V squared over C squared. So in the Google search results, it didn't put that in there. But when you click on this link, it has it correct throughout the whole article. So if he would have just clicked on a link, he would have seen the right formula. So it's just in the Google preview that it had v squared times c squared. But just to show you how much he doesn't understand science, v squared times c squared gets you units of velocity to the fourth power. And unless you have a, a, a ridiculously small, of course, the speed of light is three times 10 to the eighth power. So this will never work. It's going to always be negative. So a little bit of dimensional analysis will show you that this is, there's no way that this could happen. And the thing is, is dimensional analysis is pre-science. This is something, I mean, I remember I first learned this in high school, um, in chemistry even, and uh, it's something that is is so fundamental that it, it's it, this is even before you look at the physics of it. So he doesn't understand even dimensional analysis enough to know that what he recited was ridiculous, that there's no way that it could be v squared times c squared. And the fact that it's v squared over c squared is how relativity works because if you have v equals to the speed of light then you then you get uh this this will be one so then in this case the length would shrink to zero in the case of time dilation is it's divided by the Lorentz factor so it would expand to infinity meaning there'd be no time and anywhere in between that you're going to have you still have to get really close to speed of light as we'll see to have these relativistic effects uh kick in 
to, to significant amounts, that is to say. But certainly, this should have been a red flag. If he had any understanding of relativity at all, first of all, uh, I know people say, well, he didn't know the formula, so what? Well, the thing is, is Craig actually told him the formula, okay? So it's not like he was having to recite the formula from scratch. He was not able to recognize it when Craig said it out loud, and he tried to correct Craig. So if he had seen that formula before and worked with it, he would have said, yeah, Craig, that's, that sounds right. He wouldn't have disagreed with them. A fundamental misunderstanding of relativity. And he's trying to school us Globers? What a effing joke. My gosh. It, it's just so ridiculous that he thinks he's schooling us. And he doesn't even know dimensional analysis. He admits math sucks. And he doesn't even know the Lorentz factor or even be able to recognize it. Um, but it gets worse for Witsit here. And I just want to... This is almost laughable. Um, again, it just shows a fundamental misunderstanding of, of relativity. And, and, and don't get me wrong. If somebody has not studied relativity, I would not hold them this against them. But he's trying to school us. He's done three episodes now of schooling us Globers. So if you're trying to teach us about relativity wits it, you need to know things like this. I mean, it's one thing just to not know it, but to be teaching this subject to, I mean, to thousands of people. I'm mean, looking at your views. You're getting like five, seven, ten thousand 10,000 views on these three Glober videos. You don't, you don't understand the subject. So you, you don't, it's inexcusable that you don't know these things if you're teaching it. So listen to this next clip here because it shows he fundamentally doesn't need to understand the notation that Einstein uses. Assuming that the Maxwell-Lorentz equations hold for a reference body X or K, then we find that they do not hold for a reference body K moving uniformly with respect to K if we assume that the relations of the Galilean transformation exist between the coordinates of K and K, whatever. It, it thus appears that all Galilean coordinate systems uh, 1k corresponding to particular state of motion is physically unique. Anyway, so and he goes on. This result was interpreted physically by regarding k as a as a, at rest with respect to a hypothetical ether of space. On the other hand, all coordinate systems k moving relatively relatively to k were to be regarded as in motion with respect to the ether. To this motion of k against the ether, ether drift relative to k, were assigned the more complicated laws. Okay, I don't need to play the whole thing there, but. But what he's reading is from this book, Relativity, the Special and General Theory by Einstein, which I have here. And he doesn't understand what K and K prime are. He's saying K and K. He doesn't say K prime. In fact, in the first instance, when the K prime came up, he said K whatever. He doesn't understand what a reference frame is. I mean, this is a fundamental misunderstanding of relativity. In fact, the funny thing is, chapter five in the very book he's reading from Einstein explains K and K prime, the two ref, you know, the two reference frames when you're when you're doing dealing with relativity. You know, things, motion is always relative to another frame, and so, so let's kind of go through inertial reference frames here because this is about school and Witsit a little bit too. So, so K and K prime are two different inertial reference frames that are moving with respect to each other. So, an inertial reference frame is a frame in which there's no acceleration, and all the laws of physics are the same in all inertial reference frames. And typically, they're frames that are either at rest or in constant velocity, constant motion. Now, positions and velocities are always relative to another reference frame. There is no absolute motion. This is what Einstein's trying to teach us. Now, when we're here on Earth, typically our K will be the Earth itself, and K prime will be things that are moving relative to the Earth. So as this example right here, you can see the train. This is an example Einstein uses in this chapter. I mean, right, again, where he explains K and K prime. And he explains the relative motion. And there's very simple Galilean relativity uh, transformation equations that, again, this is not even not anything Einstein came up with. Yeah, Einstein's unique thing, as we'll see, is the constancy of the speed of light. But just simple relativity, which is an understanding here, and the fact that he doesn't know K and K prime, it's pretty clear that he's cherry picking. He has not read this book because it's very well explained in here. So kind of just looking at this idea of, uh, of, of different reference frames and the principle of relativity as explained by Galileo, we can see that Newton's laws of motions are invariant when we go from one frame to another. This is what an inertial reference frame means. In fact, all the laws of physics are, are invariant. Um, although there was a problem with Maxwell's equations that this is where Einstein fixed it with his theory of relativity. But certainly all of Newton's laws were applicable in any inertial reference frame. And here over here is Einstein's corrected uh, relativistic Lorentz transformation equations that will transform from one reference frame to another 
and work for all the laws of physics, including electromagnetism and, and Maxwell's equations. And, and again, this comes from understanding that the speed of light is always the same regardless of what refer frame, reference frame you're in. And when you transform or try to understand the laws of motions from one frame to another and relative from one frame to another, you have to use these Lorentz transformations. And again, it incorporates the fact that the speed of light is always constant. Where over here, the speed of life is the speed of light is considered in, infinite, meaning everything is the space is instantaneous. You know, so basically, the two postulates of special relativity is first, you know, it comes from Galileo, is that the laws of physics are the same in all reference frames. And now, to make this absolutely true for all um, reference frames and non-curved space, unaccelerated frames, um, he added the speed of light is also a constant, and this is what brings about a lot of the weird things that happens in special relativity. And now we get into a four-dimensional space-time. And this is why it's, it's very hard. And again, I don't blame Witsit for not understanding it. I mean, it's a very difficult subject. But if he's going to be teaching people about it, he needs to get a better handle on the math and the basic concepts. So, um, so let's get right into the Michelson-Morley experiment now, because this is something that he fundamentally doesn't seem to understand with as far as what it's, what it's supposed to do. So let, let's hear him talk here. The question is about whether or not the Earth is stationary, right? That's really yeah. what's in question. Yeah. So I can show the visualization again, just so we're on the same page here. There's um, here you go. I think you can see that. So yeah, they shoot the light right, and one's going with the motion of the Earth, and one's going against the motion of the Earth. And what we see on the right is what should have been seen, right? They should have it should have mm -hmm. been separate because the light going with the motion is different than the light going against it. The light going against the motion should have been behind. It had to travel further, and you would have got an interference pattern. So you would have saw a difference in the light. This is like called the most famous Bell experiment ever. It changed all physics. This is where Einstein got his fame for solving this problem. He came up with relativity. This was like the whole. This is like the biggest thing that's happened in modern time and physics. And this is because yeah. this was supposed to happen right here. You see where it's longer, and that's yeah. not what they saw, right? So. He didn't see that it was like the same or just a little bit off. So Einstein said, oh, well, we'll just dismiss that it's not the same. It's close enough. We'll say it's instrumental error. And then he, mm. and he had to save the day. And so what they said was that that apparatus actually shrank. Well, you just could never tell. So that light, act, light going against the motion of the Earth actually did have to catch up to the Earth. Well, you just couldn't tell because the whole apparatus shrank. And that's called length contraction or Lorentz contraction. It's top level physics today. It's in relativity. It's used everywhere. Okay, so he's just, um, I mean, that, that experiment, he explained it in some ways. He's, you know, he explained it correctly, but the conclusions are wrong where he's thinking that the that their apparatus is directly contracting. And this is something that Lorentz did propose, Lorentz contraction, which you could differentiate from length contraction of Einstein. Because Lorentz did think that the apparatus was contracting relative to the ether. So he still believed that the ether was there. So... What Witsit is talking about, length contraction, is still an ether theory. And this ether theory, as we'll see, has, has been debunked, not just by Michelson-Morley, but by other experiments as well. And we'll go through some of those in a bit. But the Michelson-Morley experiment, the original assumption that was being tested was that just like sound waves through the air, the observed speed of light through the ether would depend linearly on how fast you're moving through the ether. This is Galilean relativity. And that the Earth was moving relative to any potential ether. The hypothesis that they came up with from these assumptions was that light would take longer to travel across the Michelson-Morley apparatus in one direction compared to the other. Now, specifically, they figured that the direction perpendicular to the flow of ether would mean that light would have to take a diagonal path, which you just saw, through the ether, while the parallel direction would not. This would show up as a shift in the fringe pattern as the apparatus was rotated 90 degrees and the troughs and the and the crests and the troughs would inter be interfered with each other. Now here you can see the original setup, and, and what they did is they did rotate this 90 degrees at, at a couple different times of the year, going in different directions into and away from the ether wind. But they did not see any fringe shift, and they should have, because if there was a relative motion of the Earth to the ether, that would have given a difference in speeds between the the, the perpendicular arm and the horizontal arm, as just explained. But no such fringe patterns were detected within experimental error margins. And interestingly, many more versions of Michelson-Morley up until even the 2000s now have been conducted up to billions of, of, of accuracy, meaning to, to like seven, eight, nine decimal places or more. 
So we know the Michelson-Morley result ha that has been more and more accurately verified does not show any fringe shift. There is no ether. There is no relative motion of the earth going through any absolute reference frame called an ether. And this is why it's considered a failed experiment because it started with the assumption that you were going to see an interference pattern and they didn't. And it failed to prove the ether, at least as far as this particular experimental goal was. And it showed that we can't treat light as we treat other waves flowing through a medium. And this is what special, special relativity and Einstein does. Special relativity gets rid of the ether. So there's no preferred reference frame that's existing like we would have if the ether would exist. It means that there's no such thing as an intrinsic or absolute motion and position. That's the cause why Michelson-Morley gives a null result. Position and motion are always relative to some other reference frame. To measure motion, you have to have reference to another reference frame in which you can measure position and velocity. And this is the principle of relativity, one of the postulates of special relativity. And it's kind of like in your car. There, I mean, there is no little device that can measure just constant velocity. And again, it's because of relativity here that's showing us that we cannot measure a system that's at rest or a relative constant velocity are identical. There's no acceleration. So accelerometers are only measuring acceleration. Now, when it comes to the speedometer of your car, that's just measuring the rotation of the axis of the wheels. And it's literally counting how many times it goes around per unit time and guesses the speed based on the standard tire size for your car. So if you change your tires, you're going to get, your speedometer is going to give you faulty readings if you get a really big tire, for example. And just another note of measuring the orbit around the sun, the Michelson-Morley experiment is, de is not designed to pick up rotation. And I've heard Jiren say that some of the, the fringe because, you know, in the original Michelson Moore experiment, they, they did pick up a little bit of friendship, but it was totally within the error margins, just a small amount. And I remember Jaren saying that that was picking up the rotation of the Earth. No, that's not what it was picking up. Of course, for them, it's the, it's the swirling ether they think it's picking up. Uh, but no, th these are not designed for rotation. They're designed to, to, to measure linear relative velocities. And... Um, and again, the more accurate recent experiments of Michelson Morley have only verified this null result. Now let's talk about how Witsit thinks, seems to think that we should be able to measure the Earth's orbit around the sun with one of these optical type of experiments. Uh, they show that the Earth wasn't moved, right? It was over 10 times more precise than it needed to be to detect the Earth's orbit, which is allegedly like 66,000 miles per hour, right? 30 kilometers a second. And it didn't detect it. Since then, we have billions of times more sensitive tests still never detect the orbit. And so instead of acknowledging, oh, it looks like the Earth is stationary, what they did was make up a whole new paradigm of physics at a fourth dimension of time and say that the apparatus contracted, but you could never measure. So it's just like a religion. Yeah, and it's it's funny he says it's like a religion where actually the flat Earth movement, that's exactly what it's like, a cult to religion. And so, um, again, we going back and forth on this over and over, and I keep trying to tell them that the Michelson-Morley was never designed to detect the orbit of the Earth around the sun, or that is to prove the orbital speed of the Earth around the sun. This is not its purpose. Again, you cannot measure constant velocity, and because the Earth is on a geodesic or is in free fall around the sun, a geodesic is the, it's basically like the, the shortest distance between two points in Euclidean space is a straight line. The shortest point between two distance in a curved space-time is a geodesic. So again, because the Earth is on a geodesic going around the Sun, you're not, we're not going to be able to measure the motion um, using, using instruments. We use other things, as we'll see, like stellar aberration and parallax, which we'll talk about in a minute. So Whitson just thinks that this null result means that we can't measure the Earth around the Sun. And now, he is right. Our instruments have become a billion times more sensitive. However, they're not designed to measure the orbit of the Earth around the Sun. Now, we can very accurately measure the Earth's rotation because rotation is more of an absolute type of motion. When you, The Earth's rotation can be measured with, um, you know, ring laser gyroscopes and mechanical gyroscopes, Foucault pendulum. So there's many ways to measure the Earth's rotation, but we can't measure the orbit of the Earth around the Sun with these type of instruments. We have to use um, celestial objects in our frame of reference. And... And this is something that Witsit just is so stuck on, and he just can't seem to get it. And funny enough, he reads this chapter 16, um, um, again, on all three of these schooling Globers um, shows. He, he goes to this, he basically says the same quotes over and over. All he's got is quotes. He doesn't understand the math. He doesn't understand relativity. 
I mean, the fact that he doesn't know what K and K prime is just laughable. And, but even from this chapter that he's reading from, um, here, uh, it talks about, Einstein talks about stellar aberration about the orb around the sun. So Einstein's acknowledging right in the chapter, if anybody gets this book, just to see what Witz is talking about, it's Relativity, the Special and General Theory, page 62 to 67 is what Witz is constantly reading. And it, it's right here. We refer to the yearly movement of the apparent position of the fixed stars resulting in the motion of the Earth around the sun. And this is aberration. And due to the influence of radial components of relative motions of the fixed stars with respect to the Earth and the color of the light reaching us from them, you know, redshift and, and, and Doppler type of effects we can use to see that we're uh, orbiting as well. So Witsit just keeps reading this here. And it's since then I have come to believe that the motion of the Earth cannot be detected by any obstacle instrument. But he, Witsit always loves to leave this part off though the earth is revolving around the sun. And only because of MC Tune and people like him as keep pointing it out that he cherry picks that, he finally is now putting it in. But again, it's not helping his case because Einstein's basically saying, though the earth is revolving around the sun. And Einstein was talking about optical experiments like the Michelson-Morley experiment. He wasn't talking about other ways to, that you can measure the orbit of the earth around the sun. He was just saying that these type of op optical experiments will not measure the earth's orbit around the, the sun that you use other things like stellar aberration, parallax. You know, you can use, you can use radar, you can use, you know, Doppler, and, and, as we'll see in many other ways. So again, to reiterate, positions and velocities are always relative with respect to a certain external reference. A reference frame can't have a position or velocity by itself because there is no absolute position or velocity. Again, this is what the Michelson-Morley experiment found, is there's no absolute frame of reference here. And it turned out that there's no such thing as an ether, which would be such an absolute reference that could be used to measure speed without any reference to an external reference. So, so yes, if there was an ether, we would be able to measure this relative velocity. We could use instruments like Michelson-Morley to measure our speed around the sun. But because there is no such ether, these instruments will not work to measure such motion. It's that simple, wits it. The ether does not exist. Okay, so let's go through some, some more evidence on the Earth orbiting the sun. And like I said, we have a number of ways, a number of types of experiments that we can confirm that the Earth orbits the sun. Like I said, stellar parallax, there's stellar aberration, there's redshift, there's Doppler, radar, and the retrograde motion of the planets. And you can see the moons, like the moons of Jupiter. This is what, you know, Galileo and they originally were seeing to give rise to the suggestion that the Earth is indeed uh, orbiting the sun. The sun is the center of the, of the, of the solar system, not the Earth is that other moons are orbiting these other planets. So again, this is good evidence that, that the Earth is not the center. Oh, it's worth noting too that the European Space Agency, they have this Gaia spacecraft that has measured, I mean, millions and millions of parallax measurements uh, of stars and um, to very, very high accuracy now. So because parallax is very difficult to measure, especially in the past when they didn't have the instruments to do so, but now we do have the instruments to do so. so this is, again, great confirmation that we're orbiting the sun, and then our sun is going around the galaxy, galaxies going along a local cluster, etc. And, and Witsit tries to use some kind of Tycho broad uh, geocentric model, which just doesn't work, and he never provides a mechanism for how it could possibly work to explain all these intricate motions. Okay, so now let's get into the next thing about length contraction here, because Witsit just really thinks that things are physically contracting. He just fundamentally does not understand relativity here. And I won't even go through all the emails, but we've just gone back and forth, back and forth. And finally, he, he just stopped emailing me back because I just kind of put this right in his face that he doesn't understand relativity. And let's kind of hear it in his own words so that way we can hear exactly what he says about length contraction. I need to look more into the apparatus contracting to understand what that means. I don't get it yet. Yeah, so but... I'd say, so like the distance that the light traveling against the Earth it would have had to travel a greater distance because Earth's moving away from it. But if the yeah. apparatus shortens and it makes up for that longer distance, it would have traveled. So it'll make it look like it didn't travel a greater distance. Even what would cause the apparatus to shorten? So what what Einstein says is that all objects in motion shorten. So everything that's moving shortens and contracts in the direction of motion, meaning we're both contracting right now. But the way that only time you really will notice a bit of contraction is if it gets closer to the speed of light. 
So Einstein in relativity just says motion. Motion causes things to shrink. And if you got to the speed of light, it would disappear. If you got to the speed of light, you would experience timelessness and time would stop moving. All that's great. Yeah, so again, Witsit just keeps thinking that that we're contracting physically in the direction of motion. But Witsit, relative to what? This is what you don't seem to get. What you're saying is more of a Lorentz um, ether um, sort of theory, or you could say it's even more of a neo Lorentz uh, relativity theory, where they have some absolute frame of reference that all things are moving relative to. But this is not what relativity says. In fact, the, all these neo Lorentzian models don't work in general, general relativity, where special relativity has a nice smooth transition. So it just doesn't work. It's just a bunch of fringe science that just doesn't work. But he's trying to say that this is what our model is saying, the correct special relativity model. And no, it's not. And it's, again, because he doesn't understand the math of relativity, which we'll see here in a second. And interestingly, like, this quote is actually right from the chapter he keeps reading out of. Thus, for a coordinate system moving with the Earth, the mirror system of Michelson and Morley is not shortened but it's shortened for a coordinate system which is at rest relative to the sun. So what Einstein is saying there is if you were sitting on the sun and the earth was going by, then you would see the Michelson-Morley apparatus shrink just by that amount I showed at the beginning of the video, okay? But this effect is not, it's a relative motion thing. It's between moving relative frames. So you're only measuring time dilation and length contraction in a frame moving at high speeds relative to you. You're never going to, measure in your own frame and even like Witsit says incorrectly it's not that it's that you can't measure it but it's happening no it's not happening in your frame because again it all depends on relative motion so if you were sitting in the center of the galaxy looking at it it's going in different speeds so it's so that's again relative to what Witsit you're saying that we shrink physically and he says it very clearly if we shrink physically in the direction of motion but he is assuming an absolute ether that we're shrinking in relative to, and that has been discarded. There is no evidence that there's an absolute frame of reference. And in fact, in general relativity, an absolute frame of reference absolutely does not work. And general relativity is one of our most successful theories that we have. And um, so he, he just doesn't get that. It's, it's relative, it's a covariance. It's a symmetry between something contracts in one frame and then as that frame's looking at your frame, those things are also contracting by that same amount. But they're, it's not happening in your frame. And it's not even happening because you cannot detect it with it. This is what you keep thinking. And it's like, oh yeah, we know it doesn't, you can't detect it, but it's still happening. No, that, that is more of a, a Neil Lorentzian relativity interpretation, which is, again, it's just not compatible with general relativity. So I like the example of muon decay. So Let's look at this here. So a good example is muon decay. Muons are created by cosmic rays that collide with the upper atmosphere. The muons travel near the speed of light towards the surface of the Earth. The mean decay time is very short. So without special relativity, muons could not reach the surface. They would decay much farther up, but they do reach the surface. That means that from our reference frame on Earth, the very fast muons time slows down. So they live long enough to reach the surface of the Earth. Now, from the perspective of the muon's reference frame, time does not slow down. It's ticking the same way. But the distance from the upper atmosphere to the surface contracts from the perspective of the muon, so it can reach it during its natural decay time. So the fact is that muons do reach the surface. Again, great confirmation of special relativity. From our perspective, it's because time slows down. From the perspective of the muon, it's the distance that contracts. What is invariant for both reference frames is the space-time interval. And again, this is a four vector. This is a, a four dimensional space time interval. But the point is, is this is why it's hard for us to wrap our heads around length contraction and time dilation, because we are not able to grasp a space time continuum. That's four dimensional space time. But from the perspective of a four dimensional space time, length contraction and time dilation are just artifacts that we're, that we're clinging on to our three dimensional space separate from our one dimensional time when in reality they're not separate. And this is why we have a hard time with these ideas. But here's the, here's the key here. Uh, I really want to highlight this. So note, neither for you nor the muon does the local time slow down or the length contract. These are only effects seen in other reference frames. This is what Witsit doesn't get. He thinks that we're literally contracting in the direction of motion, but we can't detect it. Again, relative to what, Witsit? You know, relative to the center of the galaxy, relative to the sun, that would be different contractions. But 
there is no relative, there is no absolute relative frame that things are contracting to. So there is nothing contracting or dilating in our frame. The arms of the Michelson Morley experiment do not contract to catch up to the light. Like you say, that is wrong. You are misunderstanding relativity. And, it, and it's, again, it's very interesting. I'll put a link below this video to this muon experiment because it really very clearly shows how length contraction time dilation are seen in the other frames, but neither of these two effects are happening in the frame that's observing them. It's, it's, a, it's a covariance between relatively moving frames. And again, it's because of the four-dimensional space-time that we have a hard time grasping this. But at the end of the day, here's the interesting thing you can see over here, is the end result um, is the same because of invariance of, in both reference frames, the space-time interval. The four-dimensional space-time interval uh, is invariant. And this is what is, doesn't matter which frame you're in, you're going to see the same space-time interval in Minkowski space-time. And, it, and again, it, it, it just takes some time to work with the math, to work with these ideas. And slowly, if you do work, work with it, you'll start to make more sense. So let me play this little clip here real quick, and it, it relates to some questions he was asking me by, via email that I did answer, but he never got back to me. And a parrot, as in it's just a parrot contraction. You know, like the skyline of Chicago was apparently up over the apparent curvature, right? So it's, and, it, and then Einstein came out and corrected him for saying that. This is what he said. The author unjustifiably stated the difference of Lorenz's view and... Uh, the contraction, or whatever, and I can't read what that says, and mine concerning the physical facts. The question as to whether length contraction really exists or not is misleading. It doesn't really exist insofar as it doesn't exist for a co-moving observer, as in the observers also contract, as is all the space around the observer. Everything's contracting together, quote-unquote, so it really exists, i.e. in such a way that it could be demonstrated in principle by physical means by a non-co-moving observer. Meaning if you were outside of the reference frame that's moving, you'd be able to physically measure it. It's a physical change. He corrects him and says, no, it's not just subjective and apparent. It's a physical thing that happens. It's physical. Real. Okay? Okay, so um, going back to this quote here, I mean, Witsit was, he, I thought for a moment there he was going to understand what it was, what's going on. But what he's clinging to because it is a physical thing that you can measure in other reference frames moving relative to you. He was actually correct when he said that. But then he keeps sticking to that our, that things are contracting in our frame, but we can't measure it. Meaning, in his mind, because another reference frame can see our frame contract from their frame, he thinks, incorrectly, that our frame is contracting the direction of motion, but we just can't measure it. No, that's not what's going on with And again, there is... Relative to what? There is no absolute reference frame to contract relative to. There's only contraction and time dilation relative to another moving frame. And you can only see length contraction and time dilation in other frames moving very fast relative to you. It's not happening in your frame, in our inertial frame. And it's not that it's happening, but we can't detect it either. That's also wrong. Just fundamental misunderstanding. So, so he was asking me, is contraction shortening a real physical phenomenon according to special relativity? And the answer is yes, but it doesn't happen for an observer in his own reference frame. The physics is the same in all inertial reference frames, no change in length or time. But from the perspective of another observer's reference frame, moving relative to us, lengths in our reference frame appear to contract in the direction of motion and time dilated and vice versa. The apparent contradictions are an artifact of us regarding space and time as separate absolute entities, which they are not. This is, again, why it's hard to really get this, because you have to understand four-dimensional space-time. So the next question he says is, so are the length contraction time dilation effects only apparent? No. The effects are real, but can only be seen when one of the reference frame changes its motion. So it is not an inertial reference frame anymore if the two observers meet again. So if the observers meet again, there will be a real time difference between the two reference frames. In the non-inertial reference frame, there has been has less time elapsed with respect to the inertial reference frame. A reference frame on a geodesic is by definition an inertial reference frame, which is our Earth around the Sun. So you never have length contraction and time dilation in an inertial reference frame. It's always relative. So it's because, the, then the twin paradox, it's the twin that went off and accelerated and came back again. 
So that frame was not an inertial reference frame. That's why when that twin came back, he was much younger because time did actually dilate. But it only became apparent when they when they met back together. You know, during the whole process, their own they were each measuring their clocks ticking at one second per second. And um, so it's this is this is kind of the paradox here, and, and we'll talk about the twin paradox in another video because it takes a little bit of setting up, and I don't want to get into the details of it here. But but this is why it is a real effect. Now, interestingly, there is no equivalent of time dilation or the twin paradox with length contraction. And we'll go over that another time too. Um, we can see this in the la latter paradox and some other things. But but the, but definitely time dilation, we can see this in GPS satellites too. You know, satellites with atomic clocks, you know, if they come back, we can see that the time definitely slows down. And if we don't account for time dilation due to both gravity and relativ relativistically of, of fast moving speeds of the satellites, our GPS numbers can be off by, you know, seven to 10 miles or more. So how is this possible? I know this sounds kind of incredible, but it's a consequence of four-dimensional spacetime and the Lorentz transformations. It can be explained by drawing Minkowski diagrams. When, when the non-inertial reference frame changes its inertial motion, doesn't matter how fast, its reference frame rotates in spacetime with respect to the inertial reference frame so that when they meet again, the elapsed times are not the same anymore. The rotation of the reference frame in four dimensions breaks the symmetry. This is confirmed in countless experiments and applications like GPS, like we just said. So this twin paradox, it is, it is explainable, but it's not explainable in a very easy way because to really see it to where it's not a paradox, you need to draw a Minkowski diagram and do the math. This is why math matters with it. So length contraction and time dilations are real effects. They're very physically real effects that can only be observed if one reference frame is not inertial, but turns around or moves in a circle. So, and then Whitson asked me, does the path of light shorten due, its, due to length contraction? So in, in its own reference frame, the co-moving frame with the interferometer, no. Again, this is why the speed of light is invariant. There is no ether background. So when we're shining the light through the interferometer, we're shining it within our reference frame. And the speed of light is invariant in all reference frames. This is one of the things that Einstein discovered. There is no going faster or slower relative to an ether. Um, so, you know, this, this is really, really important to understand that the speed of light is invariant, and that's what leads to all these kind of weird things. And the Lorentz transformations come about from the principal relativity and from the invariance of speed of light. Okay, so coming down the home stretch here, so one of the things that, that Witsit does bring up in these talks too is talking about the ether. And it's important to realize that when Einstein talks about ether, he's talking about it as a field a quantity which has values over all of space. So there are many different ways. This is a problem with flat earthers and fringe scientists as they take these papers that use the word ether and they just grab onto ether and they think it's their version of ether. But the truth is there's many ways that you can define ether. I mean, besides just the d definition of the medium for which light travels. And Witsit doesn't use that definition. If you listen to some of his talks, he's, he's got some other version where, where light doesn't have a speed. Everything, it's just kind of a ridiculous version. But, um, but yeah, so, so when Einstein refers to ether, he's referring to it as a field. And this, in this instance, the value is the curvature of space itself. And again, it becomes apparent when you see him use it in the context he's using it. And again, besides the Michelson-Morley experiment, and I, maybe I'll go through this in another video, there are many other things that have ruled out um, the ether. So it's not like Michelson-Morley by itself definitively gets rid of the ether, because you can talk about um, ether drag, you can talk about Lorentz ether and these other ether models. But when you look at all the different experiments, um, you know, the aberration, Kennedy Thorndike, Michelson, Gale Pearson, when you put them all together, you're going to see, and the D's here are, are, are basically a null result. So it turns out when you look at all these models of ether, they all have one or more X's in them. And in fact, there's emission theories too that don't work in every theory. But look at special relativity here at the bottom. It comes out clean. It's the only model that consistently passes every test. This is important. And to this day, it has not been falsified. And contrary to flat earthers think, both special and general relativity within their domains of applicability have not been falsified. They are our most accurate theories that we have at the levels beyond the quantum. And even going down to the quantum, there is a quantum correspondence principle where you can take expectation values of, of the main variables like position and momentum 
and you can translate them into classical mechanics. But it's still quite an impressive feat that we have these theories that have such amazing predictive power. And, and flat earthers, what do they have? They have these, these fringe ideas of vortexing ether and all this ridiculous stuff that doesn't make any predictions about the world and universe we live in. And even when someone like Witsa gives you citations, their citations typically disprove their, what, they, what their position is. So it's just kind of laughable that they're trying to discredit our su successful scientific theories, incredibly successful, that have given us all the technology, all the wonders of the world we live in, and they themselves even admittingly have no model. Uh, it's, just, it's just almost laughable. And Well, anyway, this is kind of a long video, but I do want to get this out there. This is the first of many, and I'm hoping that Witsit can maybe respond to this video because he has not responded to my emails. And we can kind of get maybe some more clarity on his position. Uh, I think I understand it now better, but then um, I'm pretty clear how, how he's wrong, as I've explained in this video. But still, you know, I'd like this conversation to continue, and hopefully we can get to a better understanding of relativity. And um, it's, it's actually an interesting topic for me, so I enjoy doing this, and hope you enjoyed this video. Like and subscribe, and please leave some comments. Thanks again, and have a great night.